So here's a look at today's job, this Blue Master 3, but we're going to be mixing things up a little bit and giving you a bit better of uh, a behind the scenes view here. Switching it up to the GoPro Paint Vision, and uh, that's yours truly running around looking for random items to help make this paint job go smoothly. And in this case, of course, I'm taking the regulator off of my brother's gun to uh, put it on my Iwata here because I've misplaced all of my regulators. I got like six guns in that case, but no regulator. So, um, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm, that's the ground coat that we have mixed up in the PPS cup there. And this is another one of those jobs which you hear me complain about all the time where they don't use the proper shade of primer. So, if we had have used the proper shade of primer, I could have skipped this step entirely, but now you're going to see I'm going to have to get the proper, you know, the proper um, undercoat color, which is how they do it at the factory, so that's how we have to do it, and it's going to increase the size of my blend. So, um, I'm taking my, uh, you can see I have limited space on the fender, which you'll see in a moment. Uh, right now I'm just kind of going through, uh, that's his air, his air blower, it's some sort of a, th I think it's, um, an undercoating gun or something like that. Okay, so keep in mind that most of the things you see lying around in this booth and the way that this booth is kept, it's not something I do here day in, day out. It's something I pop in from time to time to keep the old pencil sharp and bring the video camera along so, um, you know, everybody can enjoy what uh, we do here. So. I'll be complaining about things, and if you're wondering why I'm not changing them, that's why I'm not changing them. This is not my baby anymore, so um, I'll make my suggestions, and that's and that's where we'll leave it. So you can see the uh, blend space that we have right there. It would have been better if we didn't have to paint um, or apply this ground coat and um, just went straight to the blue. So again, if we use the proper primer, we wouldn't have had to put on this unnecessary coat, uh, which is going to cost us material, it's going to cost us time, and it's going to cost us blend space. So, if you learn anything today, or in probably the last 20 videos I've done, make sure you use the proper value of undercoat. So, as we get through this completely avoidable step, I'll just talk a little bit more about these guns. I've had a few people asking about the guns and the gun cases and stuff like that. So, I mean, I got the LS400, as I told you here. I've got a few of them. Um, actually, I'm going to go through the guns later. It was more the case. People were asking me where I got that case from. So uh, it came from SATA. And to be honest with you, I was a little disappointed because the branding on it said Mastercraft. And uh, I don't know what to think of it. I ordered this thing straight from SATA. And uh, I'm not sure, but maybe somebody can tell me about this. It seems like a little gimmicky that this would come straight from SATA and then have a Mastercraft branding on it. So uh, you guys let me know. But anyway. Let's get back to this job here. So we're going to be applying this over all of the white primer that was originally on there. Anything, we want to have the same color. So the blue, because the blue otherwise would take about five or six coats to cover. And we don't want that. So now that that's on and flash, we let that flash for about five minutes. And what's uh, a little unusual on this job, and, and you can do it. Well, actually, sorry, this is still the gray that's going on. I had to touch up that. Uh, I just want to make sure I had full coverage there. Um, what's a little unusual on this job is we're using the solvent for the gray and then we're going to use waterborne on top, which you can do with the onyx. You can use solvent, um, underneath of water, but you can't go the other way around or the paint job will fail. And I probably would have done this entire job in solvent. I, I prefer solvent whenever I can use it. Um, but the reason was we just simply ran out of the SB02, which one of the binders. So, uh, rather than wait for that to come in, just do it in water. The water works fine, but personally, I prefer the, uh, the solvent. Um, as you can see here, that, that key is not the greatest in the world. It's got some sort of rust staining on it, which uh, kind of freaked me out. Um, so yeah, again, these are the things you go to different shops and everybody has a little bit different way of doing things. And some things are kept a little bit better than others. So this is the automatic washer that we, well, I try to use after every job. The problem is being out in the field with those guns too, is a lot of places don't have these top notch watchers, which is kind of frustrating. So, but here I break my gun down every time 
and throw it through the washer. So here's the gun we're going to be using to apply the blue base coat, the SATA 5000 HVLP with a 1.3. We're going to just check it to make sure everything looks good because the LS400 wasn't in the greatest condition, like I say, when it's being used out in the field. It's, uh, it's difficult sometimes to clean it as well as I, I could in this uh, facility. So we've got the blue water. I believe this code is 41B, but don't quote me on that. Some sort of Mazda blue. We'll go with uh, Firefly blue. Sounds like a good color. So with tacking my jobs, I like to tack as often as I can. So in between pretty well every coat. Uh, on a higher metallic color, I'll generally skip tacking after my final, my final mist coat or effect coat. And um, just so I don't disrupt the metallics. And if you're going to tack the panel, you want to make sure you tack the entire job though. So uh, everything looks all uniform and consistent. You don't have any streaks or whatever kicking around. So if you can read that gauge, it's being set, I believe, around 24, 25 PSI. Maybe a little higher, actually. I think 26, 27. This out of 5,000, yeah, HPLP. A little higher, um, but uh, I'll play with it till it feels right. And on the wall, I tend to set the wall regulator around 60. It depends on the length of the hose because you'll have a certain amount of pressure drop. So um, that's uh, usually in that ballpark. If you go too high, then you'll have a lot of air surges and it's gonna be kicking dust and stuff around every time you pump the trigger in your gun. So that's what I aim for. So as you can see, this blue covers really well over that gray undercoat. If we had he went over the white to uh, the lighter undercoat, you'd still be seeing it right now. So um, if you try and skip this step, you'll usually end up putting on a whole whack of base coat and then um, you know, it's usually you'll run into one problem or another. Maybe it's some sort of trapped solvent. You start rushing the job, blowing it off by hand or cranking the heat on the outside there to make it flash off. And that's when you start running into trouble. So following the procedure is key, especially on these transparent colors. So trust me, anytime you have the opportunity to use the ground coat, make sure you do so. If I haven't made that clear yet. Now, some other things worth talking about here, which is uh, staring me right in the face and it's making me angry again looking at it, is the fact that I did not have any newer PPS cups. So, try once you try to reuse these PPS cups forever, they get covered in overspray and dirt and stuff falls on them in your paint job. So, don't get too attached to them. I went looking through the shop for a new one, but they did not have one. So, that's, you know, I think the best one that I had to choose from. So that's what I'm using, obviously, but if you can avoid that, make sure you try and replace them as often as possible. Other things, you'll see the quality of this airline in a bit. It hasn't been changed in uh, quite a few years, and you want to change them not only just because the outside gets all full of gunk and whatnot and ends up getting kicked around in your paint jobs, but the inside of the hose can break away too. So little bits of rubber and stuff on the inside of the hose can start firing through your paint lines into your paint. And of course, nobody wants that. So, um, also, after each coat, it took me quite a while to get into the habit of doing this, but I see, I've seen a significant difference in doing so is just to make sure that you don't throw your airline on the ground after and make sure you find somewhere to hang it. Just the first, uh, I guess, six feet of the line. Make sure it's always right there. Make sure it's always wrapped around something and not on the ground or else you're gonna, and uh, it's amazing how, how many places do this. There's a lot of painters I run into that, that's it's just a habit, it's a bad habit. Um, so if you find yourself doing that, try to get out of it, and I think you'll notice the jobs come out quite a bit cleaner. And here you can see the condition of the hose. This hose hasn't been changed since I was spraying here, which would have been over about two years ago, I guess, was the last time I was working on the bench full-time uh, in and out painting here. So. Um, yeah, that hose is definitely, it owes them nothing. It's probably time to look at changing that. So here you can see with our base coat, we're gonna try to keep that color from getting all the way to the edge of the fender, fender and throwing off the color. Um, but uh, you can see a little bit is gonna be ending up there. The color looked pretty good in the chip, so I think we will be fine. We're just gonna blend it through that door and try keep try to keep it away from the top pillar as well, the top of the fender where it meets up against the post so we don't have any color differences there. Another thing, we are painting the side of the bumper, the right, well, the driver's side, and then we're gonna be blending the other side. So you're gonna have a fat, it's gonna line up and look factory on, I guess on the passenger side, 
but on this side it's actually going to match better than factory so um you know some that kind of puts you in a bit of a bind sometimes you wonder do you want it to match or do you want it to look factory and most of the time you want it to match and that's what you end up with um, since i ended up you can see i'm dusting both sides there so right there i did bring my color a bit it just kind of gives it the reason for that it's just so we have kind of the same effect going on in case there is a slight color difference if you look at it from one angle on either side it's going to look the same way so that's why i dust on a bit of color there but other than that here uh Here's the final coat going on this. So in, in total, we have two coats going on. So we've got five minutes flash time in between each. And then we're putting on uh, like a drop coat, a mist coat, whatever you want to call it. Basically, I'm increasing my distance from about 12 to 16 inches, roughly. And uh, just evening out the metallics and shifting the color to the proper position. So we're almost done the base coating process. And I feel like I've been talking forever so I'm going to just shut up for a few minutes. So you want to pay attention to those offsets. Sometimes it's easier to just kind of get at them from the back. There's different stands as well. Those aren't the greatest stands in the world. I've used some other bumper stands in the past at different shops and they work quite a bit better. So we're going to just check things over here with the sun gun as we normally do. And here's another tip on keeping the dirt down is keep these things out of the booth. As you can see, that thing's been kicked around. It's full of uh, uh, body fill and dust and everything. And as soon as you turn that on, the fan activates, which keeps the light cool and that's going to shoot dust out of it. And if you're checking over a job where it's still flashing off or wet, um, it's going to kick a whole bunch of trash into your job. So you got to be careful with these things too. So everything, everything's a potential dirt trap for your paint jobs. So we're, uh, and this gun, I mean, this light here, it works by, it operates on a spectrum closer to the sunlight. So it kind of provides uh, a whole, you know, whole spectrum of light that rather than just your oranges or your blues or whatever you would have with your incandescence or fluorescence and it you know it's handy for making sure that you don't uh, put your clear on before the base is covered then you pull it outside and you find that there's a primer spot so that's what, why we do that and here we go so we're going to apply the clear now we've got the SATA RP with uh, 1.3 this is the 5000 and um yeah, I, uh, it is not my favorite gun, but I'm going to use it anyway. I like the Iwata WS400. It's still my number one. I like this gun, don't get me wrong. It's a great gun, but my choice right now is the Iwata. So uh, we're using the RM Clear DC 5995, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice clear. It's kind of like the 220, the Glaser 923 220 that I've used in the past, but uh, a little different. So you'll see how it goes on. It's an all-around clear you can speed it up slow it down if you need to um, but from the most production jobs it works just fine with the regular hardener and maybe a fast reducer so uh, we're gonna just we're not with the first coats I tend not to get too crazy with fussiness as far as offsets go I'll just kind of try and get the bulk of the area and in my blend areas where I don't really need two full coats of clear I'll go a little bit lighter and same goes with the edge of the door you'll see in a minute um, we'll try and keep the uh, keep the edge of the door from getting too much build of clear so it doesn't magnify the color and cause a bit of a visual difference so um yeah i'm gonna just do that thing again where i let you watch this and uh, enjoy but also 
I want some feedback on this. So pay attention to this, these, this angle, as you can tell, I, I don't often go with the GoPro, but it's a new toy. And you know what? I'm digging it because it gives you a perspective that I can't really offer you with the static shot. So let me know what you guys think of that. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I've heard some complaints, but, um, most parts been positive. So, uh, I'll let this roll and you guys can watch this coat being finished off and check out the second. So we're going to be careful on these style lines because that's where you're going to usually run them if you're going to run them. Um, so you want, don't want to get too heavy on there. Another place you'll probably run uh, a new painter especially would be those door handles. A lot of style lines around there. And um, so yeah, the key here obviously is to get this on as even as possible. Um, I don't know, my gun almost looks tilted from this vision. I'm trying to keep it straight. I think it is straighter than it actually appears on this um, camera angle, but uh, anyway, um, we're in the home stretch here. As you can see, right before, right after I did the bumper, I checked the clear, make sure you have enough. You wanna make sure you have uh, about the perfect amount to get through this job. You don't wanna run out or else you're usually gonna have to end up putting a third coat on. So you wanna mix a little bit more, but not, you know, not a whole gallon more, obviously. And then you gotta get down and look down it like that, look down the panel, that's how you're gonna see any dry spray and imperfections in the clear. And depending on the speed of the clear that you're using, you have a little bit of a window to dust a little bit more on and maybe reflow it and fix up any areas where it didn't go on exactly as planned. And the next thing, of course, is to make sure we hang up that airline and uh, then admire the rest. Check everything else out here and see if we got any runs. I mean, these bumpers, they're a little trickier than you'd think. A lot of guys start out thinking maybe, you know, I'll get my feet wet spraying a few bumpers from going from the prep to the paint. But bumpers are actually a little bit more tricky than doing, I would say, that fender and door. Just all those offsets, it's tough to get in a rhythm on what to spray. You can run the clear in those pockets in a heartbeat. So 
um, you know, bumpers, they may, you may think they're easy starting off in the prep, but uh, trust me, that's probably one of the tr more tricky kind of things that you'll be spraying. But um, it's good practice anyway. So uh, with my guns here, I like to just kind of run some thinner through them. And then obviously since I have this nice washer here, I got a brush and whatnot, but I have an automated cycle and um, we'll give it a little flush through here and make it spray like new again for the next job. And if you happen to be in the market for a gun washing machine, there is one thing and one thing alone that you need to look for. And that's a gun machine that has a really good beat to it. So they all have like a different sound when you turn on the, the cycle. You wanna have one that you can dance to and really get into, like that. You know, you feel like dancing when you hear that sound, so. If it doesn't do that for you, then you're picking the wrong gun washer. So make sure when you're in the market, you get a demo and see if it feels right. So I like to blow them all off here. It's better to use the blower rather than rags because rags have lint on them and you get lint in your gun. It's gonna contaminate your gun. You're gonna get stuff, trash in it that you think is dirt, but it's really coming off of your rags. So try to, uh, I mean, you see me laying it on the cotton there. It's probably not the best place for it, but um, I, looking around, I don't think there's really a best place so try to have a best place at your shop and things will you know things will be good so we're going to get over to that gun case in a second here i'm going to show you the different guns that i have because i know uh, i've had a lot of interest in that gun case so let's go do that but first of course i have to assemble this little guy here the rp the 1.3 we're going to throw it back in the case here and uh, yeah, let's go over things here. So yes, here's the Iwata LS400. And uh, that one that I'm holding there is, what, that's the, I believe it's a 1.3, if that's one I used earlier. Now I have another model here, which you can see is missing the fluid needle. So that's actually, it's got the 1.5 tip on it. I mean, I could have just bought the kit and changed the kits when I, because I usually spray their Glazerit or Onyx, and they both have either a 1.3 or 1.5. And um yeah, so we'll move on to the SATA RP, or sorry, the HVLP 1.3 I use for base coat. And then that one, there's my mini jet. I think it's the 4400, the SATA 4400. And uh, it's good for blow. And it's an RP, so it's not great for base, but it's good for clear. This one here is the 1000 RP, which uh, it's like the economical RP line that, gun that they have. I'm not impressed with it, but uh, it gets the job done. There's my baby there, the Iwata WS400, my absolute favorite gun for clear coat. It's got me through some pretty tough times and made painting a lot easier than it has been with some other weapons I've used. And of course I've got this toy here, which is my mill gauge. It's fun to just kind of go around and measure the thickness of paint everywhere. It is kind of interesting actually when you go put it over primers and stuff and uh, and you can kind of see how thick the, these coatings are and kind of gives you an idea if you're doing things correctly or not. So we'll just kind of measure some things randomly. We got this fender here covered in E-coat and you'll see just how thick E-coat is. We got one mil, um, 0.5 mil. So before painting, you should have about two mils before applying paint. So that's why when you have an E-coated part like this, you want to apply either a primer or a sealer first and that's gonna give you the foundation to keep it from stone chipping and uh, running into other paint problems. So, um, but yeah, it's also kind of neat when you see a car that's been painted you know, 40 times and you're, and you're just kind of curious. So I've come across some around 20 mil and uh, obviously that's crazy. It's gonna, paint's gonna become brittle and chip and all the rest when it hits an you know, unacceptable mill rate. So that's, um, I guess that's it. Uh, you're all caught up now, so let's, uh, Let's check out this paint job and we'll get it all assembled and you guys can let me know what you think. So again, I want to hear a little bit more about the camera. If you like the, the GoPro, if you, you get a little more that I find I have more stuff to talk about. I'm walking around and running into things that I might not otherwise see. I would have actually mixed in some footage from the other camera there, but I, I wrecked that lens. It was covered in overspray from the last job. So I've got a little bit of work to do. But we'll get that up and going anyway. I think. The ideal way of doing things going forward is have a good mix of both and I think uh, that should be cool so um, yeah I guess that's that's it for this time guys let me know what you think in the comments like share all that other stuff and we will see you next time <laughs>